Every day, your goals are asking you, are you willing to do the things it takes to get it done? ReliQuest mental performance coaches, Dr. Nicole Detling and Darren McMains discuss insights and strategies to help you level up and consistently do the things necessary to achieve your personal and team goals. Welcome to Do The Things, powered by ReliQuest. Hey, welcome back to the Do The Things podcast. I'm Darren McMains. I'm alongside our mental performance coach, Dr. Nicole Detling. Doc, how you doing? Great. Thanks, DMAC. Yeah, and we're also joined by ReliQuest founder and CEO, Brian Murphy. Murph, how's Good it going? Good to be with you. Great, man. Good to yeah. be with you both. Yeah. yeah. Well, here we are again. Hey, let's just, we're talking mindset with Murph. That's what we're doing. And, and one thing that I believe is a strength of yours, you've even described it that way, but I've seen it in action, is your decisiveness. And just the importance of, of being able to make a quality decision with limited information. And you have a great framework that, that you work through that I think would be great for our listeners to learn from, right? And, then, and we can talk about that framework and how you've used it um, for obviously great decisions that turned out great. And then yeah. maybe some that were like, ah, it didn't, yeah. didn't go so well. So talk us through your decision making process. Yeah. So one, I'd say I, I, I believe in being decisive and everybody has a different approach to how they decide things or how they get comfortable. But I make really, I come to a decision quickly, whether it's a really big decision, or a really small decision, because I believe and I've learned over time that I want to give my spa- myself space to be wrong and make the next right decision. So if I can be decisive, I have time to make another decision based on variables that are changing right along the way because nothing's static. So uh, no longer do we take tests anymore where there are multiple choice in real life. You don't get an A or a B and move on, right? And so it's cause and effect. I make a call, something changes, and then and then I respond. And you want to try to get ahead of decisions. And ult- ultimately, you're trying to see around corners, especially in entrepreneurship, technology, anything. You're just trying to anticipate, right? And so um, for me, uh, I just believe first, decide. Decide, start, get moving, go get it. Um, and then I trust my team and myself to, to make decisions as variables change. Um, and I think a key element of this is there's no fault in decision making, right? There's just got to be a fix. So if you're willing to accept that things are not going to go your way all the time and you're just willing to, well, I'm going to decide. And when the next thing comes to me, I'm going to decide again. Then it just, you just, it's a fluid thing. And so for me, um, you know, I really look at a decision making process because in business, and I think in a lot, everybody has ideas, right? And as the company's grown, I have this great idea. Oh, yeah. Great. Well, what problem are you solving for? That's where we start. Yeah. yeah. What, what problem, what are, problem you? are you solving for? Like in any decision, why? why? Like what problem are we solving for? I, usually that eliminates 60 to 70% of ideas right off the top. Because nice. it's just an idea. Mm-hmm. And, and if I believe in having a laser focus as you build a business, you know, and we should all be working with intent towards something. Now, the problem they're solving for may be, a changing marketplace, something they're not sure of yet, an opportunity, fine, that's still a problem, right? That's still something we can run at. So first, what problem are we solving for? Because what I'm trying to eliminate is change for the sake of change. Like, let's go paint a wall a different color because I just want to paint a wall today. Like, well, is that the most important thing that we should be doing? So first thing, what problem are we solving for, right? Second thing, who's involved, right? Because a lot of times, especially in business, in my mind, people... Uh, we ultimately, we like to do things to the company. We don't always think, is this something for the company? Uh, so That's an interesting distinction. Yeah. 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 Tease that out a little more. So, you know, is, is so it's easy to have an idea and it may be a brilliant idea, but if it impacts another team or another area of the company that's not involved in the conversation, it's not, you're not able to really frame yeah. out whether that's a problem you're trying to solve yeah. for. There's other contexts that can be missing. So I like people to know, okay, who's impacted by this, right? Who, who needs to be involved in this conversation, right? And so that's, that's the second thing. But when I think about, am I doing this to the company or for the company? It goes back to the problem that we're solving for. And I know that our three priorities of the company, does this fit within the three priorities? So is this going to help the company in those three priorities? Or is this just something that is a passion project of mine that I want to bring it in and do this to the company? So I'll look at, you know, communities, you know, how we support different community organizations. 
there are a lot of great community court organizations out there. We have just decided that we are going to take our expertise in cybersecurity and we are going to use our time, talents, and treasure to invest in youth-based, you know, grade school, middle school, high school, college, and we are going to drive the awareness of and the opportunity within cybersecurity. And we are going to lock in on these four to five organizations, and we're going to focus our time and energy, more than 1,800 hours a year, more than $1.8 million a year invested. We're going to do that. Doesn't mean that another organization isn't important, but this is in our focus. So if somebody says, hey, I think we're all going to go out and do X for this. Okay, does that fit in our framework? Really easy decision. Right. And so it's a way to help focus the organization. So that's what I mean. Am I doing this to the company or for the company? Is it going to help us within our values, within our focus areas? And so as I kind of look at that, who's involved? Right. Third step, what options did you look at? So what whatever, what did you all consider? Because a lot of times people have something they want to do. They can find the problem and then they'll just back into why that's the right answer. But show me everything that you looked at because the discovery process is interesting. You know, building ReliQuest over the years, we wouldn't exist if chief information security officers and CIOs didn't step back and say, there's got to be a better way to this. We were that better way. Like we were always that other option. So I want our teams as we grow to think, what all do we look at, right? Um, the, the, the fourth thing is um, what, what recommendation are you making? So what are you recommending? And lastly, which I think people don't do enough in anything, what are the unintended consequences of making this decision? Think about what could go wrong. Doesn't mean we're not going to do it, but what could go wrong when we do this? And so anytime we make a decision, whether it's to take outside capital, to acquire a company, right down to where we're going to lease office space, we bring it through this framework. And anyone that has something, an idea they want to pitch, they bring it in the framework. We just ask that you have uh, what problem you're solving for and at least two other variables that do not include what you want to do, what you're recommending. And then we'll help build a cross-functional team around you to go answer the rest of those questions. And, and what I like to do after we get to that recommendation and we hear the unintended consequences, I always check everything against, is it good for our customer? Is it good for our team? And is it good for our stakeholder, our shareholder, in our case, you know, our, our shareholder? And if I can't answer yes to those three questions, I never do it. You know, it's got to it's got to be good for all three. So that's that's it sounds simple. Right. It's a simple framework, but simple is seldom easy. Right. Uh, and it creates great debate yeah. around the org. But that's that's allows us to be very decisive. That's great. I a lot to unpack there. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> one thing that that I've seen uh, a leader do, and and I haven't told you this before, that, but but I really love what you do uh, around this decision making process. Is like, what are the what are the solutions? What are the the decisions that you've considered? Yeah. And so I'll set it up this way. In that uh, was with a leader a while ago who made this mistake, but great sentiment made this mistake. Said, "Hey, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions." Which I get. That's a, like, I'm not going to argue against that. But what happened was by by taking um, a stance like that and communicating that to all the people that um, were reporting to him, what happened was they stopped going to him because they would come to each other. They go, well, if I had a solution, I wouldn't need him. Like, you know, he has the visibility. And so versus saying, hey, think through some solutions. It's okay if you haven't solved it yet, but bring it to the team or bring it to me and let's decide together. Now, I think that's what that leader meant when he said, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. But what I love is how you framed it up is like, hey, what have you considered to let people know, hey, it's okay if you haven't solved it yet, but I need to know you've thought about it. Yep. I need to know that you've spent the time. You're just not bringing a problem or whatever. And so uh, I, I've seen that. And, and I love the fact that that you challenge people to think through specific variables and, and other ideas that could, can potentially solve this problem. And then we all get to solve it together. Right. Cause the smartest person in the room is the room, right? Right. Yeah. The room is yeah. the smartest person in the room, you know? And so yeah. it, it's so important that we bring those alternative um, solutions there. So we all can talk about it together. Yeah. I'm always fascinated. I'd love, I know, um, 
Doc, I love your feedback on this and DMAC as well. I, I learn a lot. I'm not a big sports fan, um, but I appreciate what it takes to play sports at high level, the preparation of those things. I've always been fascinated kind of studying some coaches and when a mistake happens coming off and the coach always asks not why did you do that or you know what happened there but the question is hey what did you see on that play exactly what did you see yeah. like what changed so I, I always kind of think it business is the same way because I can't be in every room but okay well what then what did what are we seeing out there and that's kind of what problem we saw what what changed right or it could just be I made a bad play yeah. and and hopefully we've built a team that's safe enough to say, yeah, that just sucked. I just didn't do that well. Yeah. I can, uh, I'll speak to this first and then yeah. doc, I'll send it to you. I, one of the best coaches I've been around always started with, Hey, what did you see out there? Right. Cause what happened generally what happens is you have to coach after the play, right? Cause it's already happened. Right. Now it's like, crap, that happened. We need to fix it. Right. But the best coach I've been around start with, Hey, what did you see out there? And then they followed up with, if you could do it again, what would exactly. you do differently? Exactly. Because yeah. they need to know, like, did the person just make the mistake in the moment because who knows why, or do they not know, right? And it forces that that individual athlete to start really thinking through, like, what would I have done differently? And then if they know the answer, this, some of the best coaches go, all right, cool, let's see that next time. And then off they go, right? And if they don't know, they say, well, hey, here's something to consider. So that's, I've seen some of the best coaches kind of take that two prong approach. What did you see? And then if you could do it again differently, what would you do? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I've seen the exact same thing. And I would, I would also argue that that's one of the differentiators between some of those great leaders, not just, not just coaches in sports, but even great leaders in business are recognizing that you don't see everything. You're not in every room. You don't know what that person is experiencing or what they saw and giving them an opportunity to explain that to you because they may have seen something that you didn't, which then gives you information to make different decisions as a leader as well. So I think that's really powerful, but I'd agree with you. And I've had the exact same thing with the exact same two questions, right? So yeah. what did you see and what would you do differently? And then if they don't know, that's a great opportunity to coach yeah. versus just yelling at someone totally. for making a mistake, yeah. right? I mean, athletes know when they make a mistake, they're already beating themselves up. They don't need the coach to beat them up too. Totally. Yeah. Well, they're effort mistakes. Right. Right. So, that's right. you know, that you're probably going to get yelled, not showing up, you know, that that's a, that's yeah, a mistake that's that probably, yeah. um, but, but then <laughs> yeah. there, are, you know, the, what did you see thing? And I, I've seen it with our, our kids growing up um, and some of the best teachers I've had in my life academically. And I see it with our kids. Some of the best math teachers and English teachers are the ones that will pull them aside after the test. Like, Hey, what did you read here when you read this? Or what did you see here? Same concept, nice. right? But that it's interesting to see how much more effective the kids are with a great teacher yeah. than if it's just you, you miss this question, you know, go figure it out. Right. So it is it is interesting. It works in all all areas. Yeah. I wanna kinda of pivot just a minute and go back to your decision making process yeah. because it it's pretty well thought out. You've certainly spent some time thinking about that. It sounds like a long process, but I know as an entrepreneur, sometimes you don't have that time, yeah. right? So talk a little bit about time efficiency. When you do have to make a decision pretty quickly, are you still able to go through that process? It's more of a conversation when it's a, it's a quick decision. So take COVID, right? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we, we started to hear about, well, I was actually at a conference in San Francisco where a lot of the vendors had backed out. Uh, because COVID had started to sweep through. And so, um, you know, for us, th we didn't, okay, what problem are we solving for and go solve all these? It's get the room, get everybody in the room. You got to trust each other. We know what the problem is. Let's just iterate what should we do, right? Um, now, the the question of when to come back in, that can, that can, you can take a little bit more time, but the question of when you have to be decisive. And I like to tell people we're going to get to a, we're not, there's, there's not a hundred percent consensus. I think if it's a hundred percent consensus, you probably waited too long to make the call. We want to get to a 60% consensus, but I want a hundred percent buy-in and growing up, uh, my dad would always tell us, you know, three, three sons and, Mom and dad have been uh, married since they were 18. Um, my dad would always say, hey, we're going to argue in this house. 
But when we decide something as a family, we can disagree in this house. But when we decide something and you walk out that front door, whether we decided what you want or not, you, this is the family decision. And I kind of that's how I think about the company is I want to debate, banter, beat it up. When we walk out the front, we can 60% consensus. We're going to make a decision, 100% buy in as we go out in the world and execute. So, yeah, you have to be more decisive, but some of those things are pretty fluid, right? Unintended consequences, that's a conversation. Um, but bigger things of, when do we, where do we open facilities? Where do we hire? I use it actually as a development tool. So if I have, uh, this past year, I took our general counsel who's got a high acumen, uh, for business and I gave him a business problem. And I said, you can pick, you know, you need to pick somebody from each of these functional areas, ask my team to recommend people, you interview them, put them on your team. And I want you to go run at this big problem. And I don't have the answer for it, but this is an opportunity area. So now here's a general counsel getting out of their comfort zone, going into the business, getting really hands on, working with emerging leaders in the company. So it's a developmental tool as well. Um, but the quick decisions, yeah, we just got to get to it. And we have to trust each other enough to iterate through those questions. But the framework allows us to move faster nice. because everyone's used to it. Yeah. So they know why we're cycling. Otherwise, you just get these five hour meetings where they don't, you, you didn't, what did we, you know, we just talked for five hours, but we didn't solve the problem. Right, right. right. Um, so then what do you do if the wrong decision was made? Yeah, uh, you make another decision. I mean, that's the thing about. Uh, that's, I mean, it's uh, it's it's it's. What do you do if you miss the tackle? You run and tackle the person. So that's why I've always. I grew up playing soccer. Um, you get beat in the soccer field, just turn around, run faster, you get another chance, right? I've always empathized with baseball players and Olympians. Like they get one run, one at bat, right? That's a, you know, golf, one one swing of the club. So um, I look at it as I've made a ton of bad decisions. And I tell everybody in onboarding, there, there's it is statistically impossible for any of you to cost the company as much money as I have with a bad decision. I, I'm, I, and I... I you know, I write them all down. It'll take you days to go through them all. But if you're decisive and you're willing to make the decision, you understand it's not about the fault. It's about the fix. Because the problem is when you make a bad decision, too much time is wasted trying to identify whose fault it was. Right. And if you go back to sports again, it's everybody understands that you don't stop the soccer match and and debate who missed the play right well first go make sure the other team doesn't score and we'll figure that out after the game in business too much of the time while the game's still going we want to debate whose fault it is right. and all this time gets wasted if you just i think the senior most person in every room this is our culture i do it a lot raise your hand hey it's on me let's move on let's go fix it right and so if you can live in this fix not fault world and be decisive you can decide your way out of some bad decisions yeah that actually just happened in a college basketball game and i'm gonna miss i i will not remember the teams or the coach's name maybe you'll recognize the story Go for it. i can't wait um <laughs> but uh so a team showed up to play the home team and the equipment guys left the uniforms in the hotel and so they were late starting the game because they didn't have uniforms. So the team started with a technical foul. So the game started essentially with that team being down 1-0, right? And the coach, the head coach, stood up in front of everybody and said, you know what, this is my fault. I'm taking the blame for this. Let's go play this game. Yeah. So he immediately took the fault. He didn't throw the student managers who forgot the uniforms in the hotel under the bus. He didn't try to, he just said, all right, this, I'll take the fault. Let's go fix it. We started this game down 1-0. Who cares? Let's go. And they ended up winning the game. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I think it was, and he's quoted too much, but uh, I, I read on some Golf Digest blog post where they asked Tiger Woods about bad practice rounds or bad warm-ups. Mm -hmm. And oh. he said, just because I, I have a bad warm-up doesn't mean I'm going to have a bad round. And, I, I mean, if we could all think that, way and and my golf game's awful so i can tell you if i go out to the range and hit three balls and and they're awful uh then i think i'm gonna have a bad round if i hit three great balls then i think i'm gonna have a bad round um but uh but yeah so i i love that that they just took ownership yeah. that's what it is just Absolutely. taking ownership and you mm -hmm. take all the stress and anxiety out of the room exactly and then we get right you focus all that energy 
Yeah. I, I want to talk about data a little bit too. Yeah. Cause, cause what real quick, I think if yes. that would have been a lot funnier, if the coach said the other team stole our uniforms, we're <laughs> down <laughs> zero one, go bring it to them, but go ahead. No Sorry, kidding. data. Yeah. No, that would have been yeah. funny. Yeah. That would have been, somebody might've fouled yeah. out. You know? Yeah. That's right? yeah. true. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, no, let's talk just a little bit about data, right? Cause we, we kick this thing off with how do you make great decisions with limited information? Yeah. What's happened, and I can speak specifically to Major League Baseball, right? I've spent over two decades there, and so I got to watch the evolution of data analytics come in and watch groups of coaching staffs and leaders resist it. I've watched some... Are we talking money ball stuff here? Uh, we're talking all sorts of stuff, right? right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. And so, and that's the cool thing about baseball is you can literally measure everything. everything. You have data coming out of your ears, right? Uh, but then I've also seen organizations fully embrace it, right? And then like resist the the people component to it, right? And, and I've seen how that has gone bad and I've seen how both. And so I've been very fortunate to see um, the best be able to blend, right? Have the ability to look at the data set, say, this is what's happened over the last year, the last season, the last 10 games, the last game, but then not forget the most important data set and the most important data points, which is what happened on the last pitch, what happened in the last inning, right? Well, what happened with that person coming in today, right? Because I think what happens is sometimes people get so caught up in data, at least, again, I can talk about baseball, they get so caught up in data that they forget that the most important data point is the person in front of them on that day in that game is going to impact what pitch is going to be thrown or where you can play or, or position your infielders, whatever it may be. And so in business, I know tons of data, right? Yeah. How do you, how do you sift through that? How do you work through that when you see it? How much do you use it? Like, how do you blend making big decisions with tons of data and understanding people as well? Yeah. I mean, look, cybersecurity technology, it's a, it's a data business. Uh, I'll try to simplify, please, a complex problem. <laughs> this will be good. <laughs> um, I look at what is the intent of the data being used. Most of the time, data is being used as a reason to support what somebody wants to do, right? Or, or to, to give you a reason why they shouldn't do it, right? And so I think that data gets used inappropriately as a weapon in some ways. And I'll give you an example, like raising capital. Okay, you go out to raise capital. Maybe you have an investment banker that's put together your pitch. You've got venture capital, growth equity, private equity, whatever stage you're in, um, or if you're going public and you're out in a roadshow. And and you, your company, puts together data to put you in the best light. That potential investor is taking the same data, turning it on and using it as a reason why you're not as good as you think you are. And so I always look at what's the context of the data. Data is an input, but it can be manipulated. It can be used and slanted. to. And so if you really step back and are you removing emotion and using the data, um, but you have to apply logic to it. Um, and I, the, I actually think young leaders get this wrong more than any. you get super intelligent people that come up, um, it through the ranks and they grow cause they're able to understand a lot of different things. They're able to use the systems. They're able to deal with people. They're probably good with customers. Um, but as they come up in leadership, they start to rely too much on the data because that gives them something to point to their decision making around instead of owning the decision. Well, the data shows. And so what I try to use with people all the time is, Hey, I don't really care what the industry says. I don't care what the data says. I don't care what the guru book says from 10,000 of this and blue oceans of that. I don't really care. What should we do yeah. within these four walls with our values? And a lot of people hear me say all the time, I don't care. What should ReliQuest do, right? Yeah. And it's not that I don't care. I read all those books. I consume the data, but I step back. Okay, now apply it to this situation and and can we be independent in our decision making so that's kind of how i think about a lot of those things including you know books i mean you go back to we've talked about this before somebody will read a book you see it all the time they get excited 
you know, 171 ways to be better than everybody. And they come in and they want to start making the 171 ways and implementing every single thing. And I painted this wall orange and I'm only wearing green socks and I'm going to dress like Steve Jobs and all of these things. But there's never of like just step back and say, okay, well, well, I learned something in this book. It was great. How does it apply to the world that I'm in? It may just be a good book. It may just be, that was a great book, but I can't apply any of this, right? And I think it's just balancing, like, am I, did I like this book so much I want to come in and do all these things to whatever I do for a living? Or is this going to be a four? Is this going to help evolve and get better? So whenever I get around somebody that quotes too many books, um, I get a little, I get a little weary, especially leadership books. Woo, that yeah. one, yeah. Well, and I think that speaks to the importance of, I mean, we mentioned last time we talked about self-awareness, but establishing your identity, one, individually, like who are you, what's important to you, what's your purpose, but also team, like what's your team identity, what's your company identity, what's your culture look like, what's your mindset at your company, because that gives you something to measure it against, right? Yeah. So it's not just, oh, this is what Phil Knight did in Shoe Dog, but it's yeah. like, hey, that's a great book, I love the story, but does that work here? Like if you don't know what here is, if you haven't defined what your company is, if you haven't defined what's important to you as an individual, then how can you ever decide if it's right for you? Yeah. yeah. And I would take it a little bit further too and say yeah. it's not just your company, but whoever your stakeholders are. So whether that's family, friends, neighbors, whoever's important in your life, does it make sense in that world, whatever it might be? So a little more applicable even outside of a business realm, thinking about who are the people who are most important to me in whatever it is and how is this going to impact them as well? I mean, going back to even your method of is this right for the company? Is it right for the shareholders? Right? Is it right for our teammates? Is it right for the customers? Right? Those three questions, those three people, you know, it doesn't have to be that necessarily, but just is it right for the people around you who are most important to you? I yep. think that can help you make some of those big decisions. A lot of what you're talking about there is what's called researcher bias, right? Every researcher who does any type of research has a bias toward what they hope to find. And they do double blind studies and all these different studies to try to take that out but at the end of the day we are human beings and we are trying to prove our points or find certain things that we believe in so i love your strategy for being able to say you know what i can separate myself from that and say this is really interesting information does it make sense for me and for the people around me if not great i just read a great book cool yep. maybe i'll learn something through that process that they used or something but i don't have to apply everything especially i agree and especially when data is used data or information is used as a reason not to do something I always default to afraid to lose, can't win. Yeah. Like, oh, so like that, uh, you know, the, well, I, I was going to do this, but 97% of the respondents said we wouldn't have, I, I don't know. I just press play. Let's, let's get out there. <laughs> let's get out there and make some bad decisions. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as, like my, as my, what, one of my what, favorite Vince Vaughn. I was going to say, what movie yeah. is that? Yeah. 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 Favorite, favorite. Let's get out there and make some bad decisions. So, yeah. <laughs> so last piece around decision-making doc, you just brought this up around bias, mm -hmm. right? So our biases impact our decisions, right? Um, and, and the thing is, is there's an emotional component to learning, right? We tend to remember things that are more emotional, right? pretty, that's part of the human experience, part of, part of how our brains work. And so I'm curious, how do you all both, like, how do you recognize your own bias where you realize like, ah, I think this is my own self getting in the way of making the best decision here, right? I'll give you a quick example of, of what I've seen. This goes back to, I remember sitting next to a professional baseball scout in, um, uh, in the dugout. He came in the dugout, he had drafted, um, couple players that we had. Um, I was managing at the time rookie ball. So uh, I remember us, we had a game on a Tuesday night, game on a Wednesday night. Tuesday night, we put our second rounder out there at third base. Guy hits an easy two hopper. Glove gets flat. He bobbles it, still picks it up and just gets the guy out at first base. Scout says to me, that's why he's a second rounder. Look at that composure. He's going to be in the big leagues. I'm like, ah, oh, interesting. Next night, we have our 13th rounder playing third base. Now the second rounder, he's DHing. 13th rounder out there playing third base. Left-handed hitters up. So our third baseman, he's playing in. He's close. Guy smokes a ball at him. It's like slicing away. It's a tough play. And he like just can't get his glove on it. And he says to me, yeah, that's why he's a 13th rounder. He'll never be in the big leagues. And I'm like, what? You know, I, and it's it, obviously it was 
emotional. It's impressionable because I still remember literally verbatim what he said. And, and that has always stuck with me. And it just, it speaks to though, our bias on like, yeah, like I'm, I'm going to see, I'm going to see what I'm looking for. And I'm trying to find, I'm going to prove that that second rounder that we chose to give a few million dollars to, I'm going to, I'm looking for ways to put him in the big league. So let's talk about his composure. The 13th rounder who he didn't give hardly anything to, right? Senior signing bonus. You know what? I'm looking for ways to say like, oh yeah, we should probably cut him. Right. And so all of a sudden you, you don't pay attention to maybe the context, what actually happened. Instead, you're letting your bias make that decision for you. Right. And so how, how do, how do you manage that? Cause that's part of the human experience. Like Murph, how do you manage? I mean, you've seen a lot, right? I mean, I can't imagine all the stuff you've seen and we all have it, right? Right. I mean, totally. I, you know, there are things at situations and, you know, even areas of the company where I have a bias, right? Whether it's a, you know, a fondness because of how we've grown or something I resisted over time, whatever it is. And I think, um, what I've, been fortunate enough is you trust the people around you when you can have a good team around you and people that that care about you and you can you know that they're on your island like they're fighting for the same thing you know for me it's my wife um i watch her reaction to things right i watch her body language will tell me a lot whether we're at a, a public event or it's a family event or or and she's always gonna tell me hey i think you're I don't think you're looking at this the right way or I'll bring something up that's frustrating or she'll overhear a conversation. She's like, Hey, you were, you were a little rough there or, Hey, I'm surprised you, you, you let that go on as long as you did. Right. And so that's a trust thing. Uh, you know, our executives around the company are, are, our owners, as we talk about our team, um, just they'll push back in a safe way. Sometimes they'll push back publicly, um, to let everybody know that's that's part of it, right? Like it doesn't matter that I'm the founder and CEO. Like we gotta we gotta push back. So I think it's just watching people's response. I don't ever want to do anything that you never want to hurt somebody. You never want to do the wrong thing. Um, and so I do have a pretty sensitive tuning fork when it comes to that. So, um, it, it, but if that trusted group around me. Um, is 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 with me, and I know I'm right, even though it's a really, really brutally difficult decision. Um, then I'm going to make that call every time, and I'll 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 you know pay the price for it. And there's been times over the years, uh, just you know having to remove people out of the business, it's been a really difficult decision. It's been hard on Renee. They've been family friends. You know, you grow this company over 15 years, and you're close to a lot of people, and those are gut wrenching. Um, but I always made the decision on behalf of the company, not allowing my personal relationship and bias to get in the way. So you have to trust the people around you, um, and not allow any bobbleheads in the business, right? There's gotta be people that are, that care about you enough to challenge you. So that's, that's, you know, as much the way of, of my relationship with both of you is just, you know, when I ask for feedback, that's the number one thing I do at the end of something. Hey, how'd that go? What would you do differently? What it's usually my first call, right? It's just part of getting better, but it's also a safety thing for me of like letting people on my Island and, and, and allowing people to push back on me. Cause you know, we, um, we build up founders and entrepreneurs a little bit too much. I think, uh, especially in the U S um, we give, we give entrepreneurs and founders a little bit too much credit and they need, they need a lot more pushback and we need it. I want it. Sure. Yeah. Sure. No. Yeah. I mean, Doc, yeah. where have you seen this? Well, yeah, I just want to uh, tally up on something Please. you just said there. You're talking, I think the biggest thing that I heard over and over and over again was trust, yeah. how important trust is. And that if you don't, so I'm curious, you deliberately have surrounded yourself by people that you trust. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's amazing. But what if you're in a room of people you don't really even know and you don't trust? Do you still use body language? Is that yeah. still kind of your go-to yeah. to see if you're, and that's how you measure your bias? It is because I do truly believe I'm a reasonable person. Like I, I think I'm a pretty reasonable person. I'm so focused on self-awareness that I, I, I feel like I'm a reasonable person. So if I say something the wrong way and I get a bad reaction, I'm going to, I'm going to tune into that. Yeah. Um, cause I, I'm not a shock personality. Like I don't like to shock the room. I don't like to be, you know, I'm a pretty, um, optimistic, let's go get it kind of person. So if I say something that kind of shakes the room a little bit, it's probably not what I intended to <laughs> yeah. say. Right. So, um, but yeah, that's, I typically just kind of watch the room. 
Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'd say I'm I'm similar to that. I think the first thing to note is that every single one of us and everybody watching this, we're all biased toward ourselves. Oh yeah. Every single yeah. one of us, we are biased toward ourselves. We all think good thoughts about ourselves and we all think bad thoughts about ourselves. But I, I don't know that there's too many people out there or it'd be a very small minority who would say, I'm a bad person. I mean, most people would think that they're good and their intentions are good and they're wanting to do good. Uh, one of the things I realized many, many years ago through some experiences I had is that people aren't generally against you. They are for themselves. And when you recognize that and you're like, wow, that person wasn't like, that was really hurtful to me, but that wasn't their intention. They were doing something to better their position or they felt was the right thing to do for them in some way. And when I learned that, that was a really big lesson for me to start saying, okay, I want to be better about making sure, taking that other person's point of view in and seeing from different perspectives, perspectives, trying to understand where my bias exists. And then do I really need to pull back on that? And do I really need to follow through on my bias or can I include some other people in on this? And the more I started doing that, the more I was able to develop these layers of trust and relationships and recognizing that I can still, you know, hold my interests primary, but not exclusively, right? There's, there's space for other people in there as well. So I don't have to be fully biased toward myself. So I think that self-awareness piece comes first and that recognizing we are all biased toward ourselves. Of course we are. That's okay. That's the human nature, yeah. right? At the end of the day, we're all trying to live and do our thing and, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, but we don't have to hold that exclusively. So that's kind of how, how that's changed for me a little bit over some experiences. That's great. That's, um, I mean, decision-making, making making great decisions is complex. We've covered a lot, right? Murph, thanks for sharing that process, right? And like the steps that you go through uh, to make the best decision possible with potentially limited information. Then we talked about, shoot, sometimes we get too much information, right? And then how sometimes our our biases play into that, but then the importance of having people around you that, that you can trust. And I love what you said there, Doc, right there at the end, where just thinking about, it's not that the person's against me, it's just that they're really for themselves. I'd never heard that before. So thanks for sharing that. I love that. Um, and, and I think for, if you're watching this or listening to this, however you're consuming this, decision making's hard. Having a process helps. Having people around you that you can trust really helps. Understanding that you're a human and that emotions can't get the best of you, be in tune to that. And, and then, but to always think about, and, and Murph, l- l- like you mentioned that you go through your decision-making process and then, and then you measure it against, is this good for ReliQuest? Is this good for our teammates? Is this good for the customer, right? And is this good for our stakeholders? Is this good for our shareholders, right? I think personally, whether, right, who are those people in your life? Who are your customers, right? Or, or who are your, your family, your friend, who are your shareholders? Like, how is your decision gonna impact the people around you? I think considering those things, like uh, to always measure your decision against is, is gonna ultimately put you in the best best possible light to, to move forward and, and, and do ult- ultimately what you wanna do. Yeah, totally agree. And, and you know, making sure you're, you're going through that motion with a clear head, right? Yeah. You're not doing it. Um, under a amount of duress or fatigue or understanding the moment you're in, you know, that the environment matters. Sure. Sure. Great stuff. Murph. Thank you. Awesome. Doc, as Thanks. always, yeah. thank you. you guys. Make, appreciate yeah. you both. Yeah. Yep. Make it a great day.